Evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Ward 5 Neighborhood Planning Association meeting for November 2022. Um, we have a couple of items tonight coming up. We're going to talk about parking services and build, building electrification. I'll show the agenda in just a moment. Um, could you put the um, slides up just quickly and I'll run through like real fast those. Cool. It's working. All right. NPA Ward 5. So the second one. So our, we like to run through this every time just to kind of introduce what this organization is about. Progress. What we do here is we provide a safe and welcoming forum. That might start to, yeah. Um, we try to make this meeting accessible. Uh, one of those things is having an in-person and an online space. And we want to engage with as many community, many, and community members as possible and uh, minimize the barriers that, that could exist to participating here. Although, you know, it does have to be at a set, set time. So it is the third Thursday of every month, and hopefully that's convenient for quite a few people. We try to be respectful in our, in our discourse here of cultural and economic differences and value all the perspectives that are, that are brought forward. Um, we'd, like, we'd like the meetings to be fun and we add creativity to our sort of agendas and sometimes we have topical meetings, um, which we will probably continue to do in the, in the new year here. And we, we don't actually endorse any political candidates, so we're a, a nonpartisan organization. So that's our, that's our front page. And I'll, I think the second one is just a list of the steering committee members. So right now we have six steering committee members. Um, I might be the only one on the meeting right now. We have, we have a lot of reasons for that. Um, Billy is planning to join a little bit later tonight. Um, so the members are Billy Clark, Joe Derry, that's me, uh, Nate Lantieri, Terry Rivers, Andy Simon, and Nancy Stetson. Quite a few of those people are from the Five Sisters neighborhood, so you might know those names. And we put our websites up here. Uh, the easy one is npa5.org. We also have the burlingtonvermont.gov website. Um, there's a quick slash npa5 to access our sort of agenda in minutes. That's the official place for that sort of legal content. And thank you, as always, to, to Sam Heinrichs for setting things up in here, as well as Charlie behind the camera. Um, he's recording for CCTV tonight. So, all right, so that will go to the ed agenda. I guess that's the, yeah, thank you. We could go back to the webinar if you, if you want. I forgot about that page. Thanks, Sam. Um, so this is how the webinar works. If you're new to this, um, you should have a raise hand button. There's different views. There's a presenter view. There's a, uh, a view when you first start. But either way, you'll have a raise hand function and um, if you're given the option, you can unmute yourself using that little microphone icon. Okay, that's the, that's the quick version. So tonight we have public forum up front for, for 20 minutes. Um, at 7.20, we're gonna talk to, or Jeff Padge is gonna talk to us about parking services. And at 7.40, um, we'll be talking about building electrification uh, policy that's being proposed. And uh, Hopefully we'll be finished by eight o'clock. So a little bit shorter than some meetings. Maybe you like that. So I guess we're ready to jump into public forum. I have a slide about public forum. I don't know if we'll really need it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There's one more. Sorry. But and I, I could probably remember what it says. I just We just ask that you limit the kind of remarks to say five minutes. Um, we'll try to remind you of that after a few you know, keep track of the time so we don't go way over the 20 minutes. And just please identify uh, yourself and, and whether you're a Ward 5 presidency and um, if you like what street you're on and whatnot. So, all right, I guess we're ready to, to jump in. Does anybody have anything they wanted to bring up for a public forum? Lucia has her hand up there. Thanks, Joe. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucia Campriello, and I am your neighbor down on Pine and Lyman Avenue. 
Uh, I have two young children who are students at Champlain and uh, my partner's name is Joe and he's been at these meetings before. Um, I'm also your elected school commissioner for Ward 5 and so I'm wearing that hat uh, in this moment for this public forum. Um, I wanted to thank uh, all of the voters um, here in Ward 5 and really throughout the city who um, helped last week's bond uh, pass so successfully. Um, we are so entirely grateful for your support. Uh, and we recognize that not every voter voted yes um, on this bond. And so um, the school board and your district leadership remain committed to seeking additional funding sources um, outside of the bond itself so that we can hold our commitment of um, spending up to $165 million um, on this bond and hopefully bring outside funding to it um, as well. So. Um, look forward to continuing to visit in this space, um, as well as in many other spaces uh, that you can find us, um, that's your school board reps, that is, um, to make sure that we are bringing the most current information and project developments to you. Um, otherwise, you're also welcome to um, find information about the project on the school district website, which is bsdvt.org, like Burlington School District, vt as in vermont.org. And there is an entire page dedicated to the project with a whole bunch of information. So again, thank you so much um, for supporting uh, the bond last week and look forward to uh, being in touch again soon. Thanks, Lucia. Uh, evening, Jason, I see your hands up. Yeah, thank you. Good to be here. Um, I'm Jason Van Dreisch. I live on Caroline Street and um, recognized a lot of the names that you read off there. It's good to see so many neighbors involved. Um, I'm just stopping by briefly tonight um, because I just announced earlier today that I'm running for city council um, to represent the South District, um, which comprises wards five and six. Um, so this is an obvious early stop just to check in and say hi. I'll be coming to NPA meetings um, in the future as well. But uh, uh, it's literally hot off the presses. Um, we sent out the press release at 2 p.m. And uh, really glad that I could make my first stop here at the NPA. So uh, I don't want to take up time with any uh, electioneering. Just wanted to let folks know. And there's more details on my website, which is jasonforburlington.com. That's it. Thanks, Jason. Sorry, I was writing down the website. Appreciate you coming in to announce. Do we have any anyone else that I don't know? We have like the, the other participants as well, maybe. But. No hands. All right. Any from anything from in the room you wanted to bring up? Lucia beat me to the punch. I was going to thank the the people for voting for the high school bond because in the neighborhood I, I live in, there's there's a a lot of talk about the cost and and you know other aspects of uh, running a city and running a school and the, the expense. And uh, I was a little worried, but uh, I'm happy to see it go through because we need a high school, as has been printed on many pieces of paper across the city. So I don't know. I didn't make a little slide deck this time, but um, I would understood that they're done blasting our road just down the road here in front of the city market. So. That was kind of some um, welcome news for at least my little neighborhood. I live down on Ferguson. Um, so we were, we we're pretty happy to see that, although it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty messy down there uh, along Briggs. It's kind of like one gigantic road made out of two inch rocks. So I guess we'll see how that goes during the frozen parts of the year, but uh, at least uh, it's making some progress. All right. Well, I took my I took my chance at the end here, so I don't think that anyone else has uh, raised their hand. So we could move on to Jeff. So I think he's been ready for a few minutes. I'm ready. I'm gonna try and share my screen here. See if I don't screw it up. Yeah. So Jeff Paget of uh, the Department of Public Works, Parking Services. All right, yeah, so uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Jeff Paget. I'm the Division Director for Parking and Traffic for the City. I work in uh, DPW, 
And I'm also a Ward 5 resident, so this is a very comfortable place for me. Um, and Charlie, our cameraman, is a parking service agent and works in my group. So this is very cozy. So anyway, uh, we have been very, very busy um, reinventing what parking means in Burlington for the past couple of years. Um, and we haven't gone around and sort of bragged a little bit about it. So that's kind of what I'm here tonight to do is to, uh, you know, gather input, of course. I'm always happy to hear, but also just, you know, shine a light on some of the, the pretty dramatic changes we've made. So uh, there's a lot in here. There's only about seven, eight slides. I will go quickly. Please interrupt me. Um, but I want to be sure to sort of just hit the, hit the wave tops and give you the flavor of what we're up to. Um, so with that, we have a motto, and it's safety and equity. We have, we realized that every, so that what we're talking about tonight is, is parking services. So what that is, is the folks that write tickets on the streets. They used to be called parking enforcement, now they're called parking services, and we have a motto of safety and equity. So every ticket that we write is either because there has been a violation of a safety issue, so you've parked too close to a corner, you've parked in front of a hydrant, you've blocked somebody's driveway, or there's an equity issue. You've parked in a handicapped spot. You've parked in somebody's front yard or something like that where you've taken advantage of this. Even taking advantage of something, even staying over a meter. If you stay beyond the time that you said you were going to stay at the meter, you're denying the next person who's coming into town the opportunity to park in that meter. So we look at everything we do from a safety and equity lens. Um, which I think is somewhat radical and definitely fresh and new and has taken some real shifting in our, in our thought process and how we operate. So how did we get to this parking service safety and equity stuff? Um, oh, I gotta back up a minute. So parking services group works within the parking and traffic division and there's three parts. There's parking services, which we're gonna talk about tonight. There's parking facilities, which is actually the, the lots and the parking garages and then there's traffic which is all the parking meters and they actually run all the signs and lines and signals and crossing guards and crosswalks and all that stuff so what's really important to understand is everything we do is not supported by taxpayer dollars it's all fee based so parking tickets pay for parking services parking fees in the garages pay for the pay for the garages to stay up and the meters pay for all the signals and signs and lines so we, we run our own show, which is pretty exciting, except when something like COVID happens and you have a massive reduction in revenue because nobody's parking. So just an overview of our general structure. But I wanna really focus on parking services tonight because um, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So our goal, although we want to, although our, our motto is safety and equity, our, our two real goals are to minimize ticket and ticketing and minimize towing. We do not want to write tickets. Tickets are merely a way that we educate people that they did something wrong and hopefully they don't do it again. And we really don't want to tow people, but if you're parked in somebody's in front of a fire hydrant or you're blocking somebody's driveway, that's a real safety issue and ordinance is written that allows us to move your vehicle. We do everything we can to avoid tickets and towing. And I know that's a hard thing for some people to believe, but we are working very hard at finding new and creative ways to avoid tickets and towing. So some of the structural changes we've had to make to make all of this safety equity and minimizing happen is we actually moved all of the parking enforcement officers that were in the, in the police department into public works and retitled them as parking service agents. So, and we also moved all of the staff from the garages, the folks that used to work in the booths, they are now parking service agents also. So, because we, because in the garages, we took the gates away and the garages run on park mobile and kiosks now. So, so we've moved staff from BPD over, we've merged them with all the parking garage folks We've retrained all of those staff members on how to do the job and actually specifically on customer service. We've had specific customer service training. And as a result, we've gone from coverage, we used to have five uh, parking enforcement officers. Now we have 14 parking service agents, which means that instead of having a pool of five, where you had one person on vacation and one person sick, that left you with three people, and you had two in the day and one in the evening. 
Now we have a full slate of five during the day, a full slate of five in the evening, and we're headed towards overnight, which means if you have an issue that you need dealt with at two o'clock in the morning, you don't have to call the police, you can call us, which I think is a real sea change. We're not there yet, but that's what we're headed towards. So those are sort of structural changes that we've made. So some of the innovations that we've been able to achieve through these structural changes and mind shifts is we're headed towards a one-stop shop. If you want to know anything about parking in Burlington, you can call us and we should know. And if we don't know, we will figure it out. One of the big changes we made is we reformed SCOF. When COVID was here, SCOF was suspended. SCOF is when you get your car towed because you haven't paid your parking tickets. Scoff, the scoff threshold used to be $75, which meant if you got one ticket for a snowplow, for a snow ban, and then you got another ticket, your car was towed. You were one and done. Now the ticket, the, the threshold is $275. So you can get four or five tickets, and you have the opportunity to pay it down. We've also changed ordinance to make it explicit that we are not allowed to hunt for cars that are in scoff. I don't, think, I don't know if you've heard about communities where the police go around, you know, looking for their quota and they're typing people's plates in, just trying to find somebody who's in scoff. We change the ordinance to make it explicitly illegal. We cannot do that. We can only, somebody is only towed for scoff if they're already over the threshold and they get another ticket. That's when they, they get towed for scoff. So that, so because scoff came in and scoff was changed, we introduced another program called Fines for Food at the same time. So this was all around the turn of the year last year. And we said, OK, we're changing. The, we're, we're bringing scoff back. We raised the limit, but how can we soften the blow even more? So we created a thing called Fines for Food, which said, if you have overdue parking tickets and you pay for your parking tickets during the, the holiday season, we'll take half of that money and we'll give it to uh, Feeding Chittenden. So it's a way to incentivize people, not only, you know, we didn't just have the stick of scoff coming back, we had a carrot of giving uh, a donation to charity. It generated $80,000 in, in overdue payments, which meant we cut a check to Feeding Chittenden for $40,000. It's pretty spectacular. Um, and we're starting that up again next week. We should, uh, um, uh, press releases should be going out early next week program starts up after Thanksgiving and runs from Thanksgiving to Christmas, or I'm sorry, to New Year's. Um, speaking of the holiday season, we actually run a free holiday. Uh, two hour, uh, it's two hours free if you use Park Mobile at any city-owned parking asset. So any of the garages, anywhere on street, any of the parks, parks and direct slots, you'll, have, you'll see on Fridays and Saturdays during the holiday season, it's two hours free parking. Um, we did it last year, one hour free every day. We learned a lot about how people used it and what was actually beneficial, and we, re, we changed it a bit, and we think this will be as effective and a little more efficient. Um, we are working with Burlington High School to provide them parking while they're at the Macy's building. Um, we've off, we offered them discounted parking. Um, we have supported them very, um, Holy on an effort to put a rooftop garden um, on top of the downtown garage. And we're currently supporting car share in their efforts to electrify not only on-street spaces, but spaces in the garage, which is actually a little trickier than it sounds because they are actually a third party. So it's a sort of like a private entity putting a private asset in a public entity. So there's some complications in there that are <laughs> it's work, let's just say that. So, so those are some of our sort of community base, how we're trying to take parking and turn it back on the community and say, you know, this isn't just about putting cars in spots. It, it, this is about how can we make the community better for a resource that we have. We have cars here now. So those, that's our community approach. Um, product and services, um, residential parking. Anybody that lives in residential parking, we have gone fully digital. Um, if you have one of those big green stickers on your car, you shouldn't. You don't need it anymore. If you are scared to take it off, come down to DPW, talk to the people in the window, make sure that everything's set. But you should not need a green sticker on your car anymore, um, which is, is huge. Um, we, one of the other issues we have in resident parking areas is contractors. 
We, I've, I've heard t lots of feedback from contractors. They don't want to work, work in Burlington because it's hard to park. They park their they park their truck in their trailer in resident parking area, and they don't have the guest pass in there. They get a ticket on the truck and the trailer because they're both licensed vehicles. So it's a big ticket, and it's bad. So they get frustrated. So we created a program for them where they can actually pay us, and they get a permit for the year. And they can go, and they can park in any resident parking zone and do their work. It's only for when they're doing their work. This is not a backdoor into getting a resident parking ticket. It's actually more expensive than a resident parking uh, a permit. Um, and we have the ability to audit it. So this is not a backdoor to, to getting an RPP permit. Um, we created a whoops program. So if you come to town and you let the meter run out by accident, you didn't have Park Mobile, you forgot to feed the meter, whatever, you can, in your appeal process, you can just put in there, I want to whoops this, I made a mistake, and we will void it. You get one a year. And this program actually replaced the blue chip program. If anybody lives in RPP, they used to have a blue chip program where you'd get these little stickers, and you got like four or five a year. So if you have friends that make a lot of mistakes, <laughs> you, know, you, well, you ran out, right? But now, you know, all of your, anybody who comes to visit you can use this program. They only get to use it once, they gotta learn. But now it's, it's, uh, it's a much broader scope and it applies to people that aren't just in RPP, it applies to anybody visiting the city. Um, we already talked about the increase in staffing from five to, to 14, which has dramatically changed how we approach um, our work um, and I think improving service. Um, and we talked about additional customer service training. That's, so that's something that, you know, parking enforcement officers never were considered as a customer service position. We are aggressively defining it as a customer service position. Um, so we're, and we're doing training to, to support that. So uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, so more to come. I already talked a little bit about the 24-7, 365 service. Our goal is that if, if uh, is, is to take <coughs> some of the burden off of the police right now. I, I, I thanked the, the police chief yesterday personally for the support that they've given us until we get to full force. Um, so, but we're headed towards a world where we, we want to see the police not having to write tickets. They have plenty to do. We can take care of the tickets. Um, we have ongoing digital perming upgrades coming. Um, we have a new back end system coming now that's handling all of our permits and all of our ticket writing. Um, it's actually literally just went live this morning. This is like a huge innovation for us. This is dramatically improving how people will buy their permits and how they will appeal their permits. Um, we have, so drifting a little away from uh, parking services into some of the f facilities stuff that we're doing, uh, Marketplace Garage is very old, 50 years old. It's at its end of life. Uh, we are holding on to keeping it running. And we have, this year, we will be starting a visioning project for what the community wants to see happen in that location. It's a prime location right downtown. There's lots of demands on that space, and we understand that. So um, that will be starting probably January, February time frame. Um, we are doing, we have a plan right now for a whole new garage signage, wayfinding, making the garage a really nice place with pretty signs, and you always know where you're going. Problem is it's a million dollars to install. So we put a pin in that, we have it on the shelf, but that will be coming in the next couple of years. Um, and the downtown garage, the big garage that's behind the Hilton and the Hotel Vermont Courtyard, nobody knows what that's called. It used to be called the Lakeview and College Street Garage Complex, which is a mouthful. So we rebranded it, downtown garage, there's new signs up. It's much simpler for the public to understand that if you get a permit in the downtown garage, downtown garage and it's downtown and that's part part of what we're reckon we understand that there are people from out of town have concerns about parking where do I park well we can say you can park the marketplace or you can park the downtown garage it's just simpler so anyway so that is my sprint through some pretty major changes we're up to I don't know if anybody has any questions happy to talk about any bits of that what online go first Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, Jason. Thank you, Jeff. That was super interesting, and I learned a ton from it. It's really nice to hear a lot of uh, a lot of things going on that uh, were completely not on my radar. 
Um, two questions. One, it's really interesting what you said about how your um, uh, parking services folks, I'm probably not using the exact right name, but this crew of folks who you've now consolidated um, are uh, available uh, um, throughout the day and the weekend and, and soon overnight. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on uh, other services that they might provide, just taking advantage of the fact that we have, you know, trained people on the streets representing the city. Um, what's your thinking on, on uh, other ways that they could add value for the city above and beyond parking as they're out and about? Right. Well, they're, they're already doing that to a degree because we, we took the gates off the garages. So the way that we enforce payment in the garages is, is they go around the garage and they're patrolling. So they're actually, whereas they used to be just in the booth, and people could always go to the booth and ask questions, now they're actually out moving through the space and creating energy in the garages. And they do answer questions. People say, how do I pay? Where do I go? Where's Church Street? So you know, they used to be called ambassadors when they worked in the garages. And we couldn't call them parking service ambassadors because ambassador is already a job description at the airport <laughs> in the city. So we call them parking services agents. And the goal is to have them be just as an ambassador. So we want them to be not sort of the person, you're, they're walking down the street, you're not running to your car to try to run away from them. <laughs> you see them and you should be, they should be welcoming and answer questions. That's our goal. We're not there yet, but that's our goal. And this, this customer service concept is that they're a friendly presence in the community and they're somebody that you want to see. So okay, and then re related to that, um, in the marketplace garage um, and in particular, well, actually let me back up. The garage that has an entrance off of um, St. Paul Street that's by the Key Bank, is that a city garage or is that privately owned? Off of St. Paul by the... By, the, by Key Bank. No. Right across from the Baptist Church. That's not ours. That's not a city garage. No. Okay. Private. Good to know. I've heard significant safety concerns in that garage, and I'm, I'm trying to learn more about how that garage is, is managed and whose it is. I believe it's Handy's. Okay. Corporate Plaza. Is what you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. In that case, not relevant since it's not your garage. We're just, all we are is the marketplace garage, the downtown garage, the main street lot, uh, the one that's on St. Paul Street under the new Champlain building. We manage that. They own it. We manage it. Um, we manage the park slots for them. They take care of the property. We help with the payment processes. Um, I said Main Street, Pearl Street, the one by the uh, behind um, City Market. If you know what I'm talking about, you go through City Market back there on the other side. I think that's it. Do all those have like park mobile is that the payment you can sort of tell almost by that everything owned by the city is park mobile parks and uh, that's why we manage some of the back end for parks because it's all through park mobile so we manage all of that and then we split the money let's see if anyone else had, had wanted to ask a question i had two two follow-ups sure. quickly sure. when's the when is the holiday season according to the parking services so Friday, uh, two hours free, Friday, Saturday, starts on Black Friday. Okay. And it's Friday and Saturday through the new year. So I'm not sure when the last is. Sounds and then good. the, and the, uh, the fines for food program starts on Black Friday also. Okay. So if you're thinking same, about, same season. So yeah. If you're thinking about paying your parking ticket today and you want to help feeding Jitnin, you can just wait a week. And then, you have to, then half of your money will go half to be Double your money. And in case anybody's concerned about finances, we did this last year. Typically, in a typical month, we bring in between forty dollars and $50,000 in overdue parking tickets. People that have overdue tickets paying us. So we last year, it was our inaugural year. We got off to a late start. We brought in $80,000, cut that in half, forty. dollars It's basically the same amount of money we were bringing in anyway. But we were able to clear out people's accounts remove exposure to scoff, and give money to feeding chicken. So it was like win, win, win. So that's, that's good. great. Cool. 
Well, the other thing was the contact information for the, so like you said, there's 24 hour coverage. I didn't know how to yeah. people reach you the best, or your team. The best way is to call them, 540-2380. That will get you straight to the parking services office. Um, if it's after hours, you can call police dispatch, which I always forget their number, but if you call it the police dispatch and you tell them it's a, a parking issue, they will dispatch to our team. Okay. Unless it's in the middle of the night where we don't have any staff yet, Not then yet. a okay. parking, uh, a uh, community service officer will, will help out. So there are, there is parking service available overnight thanks to the police. Great. Thank you. Great. I appreciate uh, the time, and uh, yeah, most of you know how to get a hold of me one way or another. So, <laughs> my my email is uh, J Paget P A D G E T T at BurlingtonVT.gov. Welcome any and all feedback, email, whatever. We're here to make things better and keep things peaceful. Sounds great. Thank you. Great. Thanks a ton. All right. So the next uh, item that we have, second item for tonight, is the um, Burlington Electric. I don't have the agenda in front of me, so I'm going to mess it up. But um, Darren Springer, Jennifer Green, to talk about building electrification policy proposal. Exactly. Oh. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> good summation. Yeah. Are we ready to kick it off then? Yeah. So do we have to, um, does Sam have anything that you wanted to share or? Um, no. Verbal. Got yep. it. Yeah, just verbal. And I know we don't have a lot of time, so we, we do appreciate it. I don't think we'll need a lot because um, we really have a sort of short raison d'etre for being here. We're really interested in hearing what people think about um, some of the thoughts we have regarding a build, building electrification policy. But before I kick it over to Darren um, to talk a little bit about that, I was going to frame it up, remind people that we have a net zero energy strategy for the city. So essentially, now that we have our clean electric grid achieved in 2014 through biomass, wind, solar, and hydro, we're excited now to transition away from fossil fuels in the built environment that generally uses natural gas in Burlington, although some unreg unregulated fuels as well, and then the ground transportation sectors. So while we offer incentives and rebates and technical support uh, and help in that regard, the city council um, is aware that policy is going to be an important element to achieving net zero. So we have been requested to, to, to provide some thoughts and comments to the city council on how we're going to further advance um, some of the electrification policies that are already sort of in, in the books. So we've been meeting with stakeholders and uh, we're here to, to meet with the NPAs, Ward 5 NPA in particular, to hear what uh, people have to say. And so now I'll kick it over to Darren, who can sort of bring us up to speed on where we are with, with policy, existing policy, and then formation. Thanks, Jen. Um, good evening, everybody. I'm Darren Springer, General Manager with Burlington Electric. Um, as Jen mentioned, you know, we've been doing a lot of work on policy development. This particular item stems from uh, the town meeting day vote uh, in 2021, when the community voted by about a 65% yes uh, margin. Uh, to approve a charter change uh, related to regulating greenhouse gas emissions in buildings. And that went to the legislature and the governor uh, earlier this year, and it was approved by the legislature and signed by the governor. And in May, uh, we had a city council resolution that Jen had referenced that asked us and the Department of Permitting and Inspections to look at ways we can make additional progress uh, with buildings. Um, we do have already on the books a couple of ordinances that are <laughs> critical in this regard, uh, one that requires rental weatherization standards over a period of several years, and another that requires for new construction that we have a renewable primary heating system for all new construction buildings. Uh, those were enacted last year and are beginning to make an impact positively in terms of our net zero energy 2030 vision with the community. Um, what we're looking at now is specifically what additional progress can we make uh, in terms of new construction uh, what can we do in regards to existing buildings uh, and city buildings? 
And in, in specific, with existing buildings, we're looking at the largest buildings uh, in the community, uh, those that are 50,000 square feet and larger. Uh, we're not looking at residential. We're not looking at small businesses. These would be larger buildings, uh, perhaps uh, less than 100 of them that would be subject to this uh, initial regulation. Um, and uh, really, when you think about it, it'd be a, a number of uh, entities that might have multiple buildings uh, within that, uh, including UVM, UVM Medical Center, the city, the school district, Champlain College, and then some others. And what we've been thinking about uh, is for new construction, perhaps going beyond just requiring a renewable primary heating system, but actually saying that if you're going to build new, uh, that the building should be fully renewable. Um, and that includes uh, all heating, water heating, uh, cooking, and appliances. And the way we've defined renewable in Burlington Ordinance so far has been uh, quite broad. It includes uh, electrification options like heat pumps or uh, geothermal heat pumps, air source heat pumps, air to water heat pumps, a uh, variety of those technologies, as well as advanced wood heating systems, uh, as well as conventional systems that have a uh, contract for renewable fuel. Uh, so that could be a conventional system that has a contract for renewable gas or for biodiesel, for example. Um, so the idea would be with new construction, you have to build renewable uh, or if you don't, uh, there would be an alternative compliance uh, carbon fee that the city could charge essentially at the time of permit that would look at the total fossil fuel use that's going to come from that system over the life of its operations and charge a one-time uh, net present value carbon fee at the time of permit. Um, part of the discussion will be how do we utilize the funds that would come from that. There was an advisory ballot question that the community also voted yes on in 2021 that advised that uh, we want to make some of the benefits of this policy available uh, to those who are lower or moderate income. Um, and so uh, one thing could be whether there is uh, an effort to use a portion of these funds to support energy efficiency or renewable energy projects for low-income households and for low-income renters and affordable housing. Um, there are other options as well, such as helping to support the city's own transition to renewables in its fleet, for example. Um, but that generally is what we were thinking about relative to new construction. Uh, for existing buildings, large existing buildings, uh, we'd look at something similar, although a little bit uh, different in a way, because uh, we would say that if you are going to pull a permit for a heating system or a water heating system, so not every use within a building, but just those those two largest energy uses, uh, then the same rules would apply. You have to be renewable uh, or use a renewable fuel or you would be subject to the carbon impact fee. Um, so that's kind of a, a brief synopsis of, of what we've been considering. Uh, we've been working with a national group called the Building Electrification Institute, which works with cities around the country uh, to explore policies and compare options and do analysis. Uh, we've had a variety of stakeholder meetings, as Jen mentioned, and uh, we've met with the wards 2, 3, and 1, 8 MPAs. We're glad to be here at Ward 5, and we have uh, Ward 6 and Wards 4, 7 coming up uh, a little later this month and very early next month. So. Uh, with that, uh, we'll pause and glad to take any questions that folks have or uh, hear any feedback that folks have about those ideas. Uh, I'll just mention we're going to present these, uh, a final report to the City Council on the 5th of December, which would uh, potentially kick off a process by which if they and the mayor agree, they could put a question on the ballot next town meeting day uh, to authorize the carbon impact fees. Uh, the charter change requires that those proposals go back to voters for subsequent approval before they could be put into ordinance by the city council. So glad to take any questions or hear any feedback that folks may have. Okay. Looking online. I have a question if nothing else comes up. Um, I was wondering if you have any idea how those fees would compare to the actual kind of renewable system cost, you know, like a minimum renewable system cost. We've been, it's a great question. We've been doing analysis on that in some different examples, trying to use like real world examples here in Burlington of buildings that have either been existing buildings that have retrofitted or new construction buildings. And I think what you look at is a lot of times the renewable option is fairly close to being cost competitive or maybe cost competitive uh, on its own. 
But if it's not, if it's close to being cost competitive, the carbon fee has the ability uh, to level the playing field essentially and to say we're going to charge you for the fossil fuel pollution that's coming out of the system. Once you do that, the delta for the renewable systems becomes much more favorable in the analysis that we've looked at. Um, and that's particularly true when you look at the rebates that are available as well for heat pumps or ground source heat pumps or other technologies. So. This could really tip the balance in some examples where maybe the upfront cost was close but not quite there. The addition of the carbon fee might get somebody to say, okay, instead of paying that, let me look again at this renewable option and see if that's more cost effective for me. Sure, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird describing like it could be for all the carbon you use on the lifetime of the system. Like that could be a huge number, like it depending on how long you think it's going to last, 20 years, 50 years, whatever, you know. Right. A lot depends on a lot of factors like that. But, it does. Uh, it does. In some cases, it could be uh, a relatively small fraction of the uh, baseline system cost, and in some cases, it could be a much larger fraction. You know, it could be 5% uh, additional cost, or it could be 75% additional cost, depending yeah. on how long the system would run, how efficient it is, uh, how much carbon it would put out. Um, but it would provide some economic rationale for really looking harder at the renewable choices that are out right. there. Right. Yeah. So I don't know if it's really if you're basing it on some you know math about the you know the carbon and what kind of a set standard for what that is is worth in terms of dollars, um, or if you're looking at it more like well let's try to make this a tiebreaker you know by scaling the feet or whatever kind of fits the various situations. Right. We are looking, uh, there are communities that we've looked at, um, New York, Denver, Boston, for example, that have uh, utilized carbon fees. And Burlington itself is already utilizing a carbon fee in a way um, at $100 a ton for our own fleet purchases within the city. We, we do exactly this type of equation. We take the conventional vehicle, we add the carbon fee, uh, net present value for the lifetime of the vehicle, yeah. and compare it to the electric option. Um, and I think we've moved from having very few electric vehicles within the city fleet to now uh, one of the more recent procurements, I think we had a third of the vehicles were electric. Um, and in fact, just today, uh, just up the road at the Shelburne Roundabout, we had uh, several electric vehicles from the city that went through uh, to help open the, the grand opening of the roundabout. I know it's been open, but I was uh, glad to drive one of Burlington Electric's uh, EVs through the roundabout today <laughs> as part of that. But. Um, so yeah, we, we've seen ranges from $100 a ton all the way up to $268 a ton, which is what New York uses. Um, so we're still evaluating what the right number would be for this type of policy proposal. Okay, thank you. Yeah. See, I asked three times and then I actually got to a number. <laughs> a range. <laughs> yes. No, that's not what I was trying to do. Appreciate it. Of course. Street in Ward 5. Very grateful for all of your rebates and incentives. Have been taking advantage of them. I'm excited about the potential for a charter change that makes sure that all of our new construction is renewable. But I'm concerned about the inclusion of, of renewable gas. Um, I've never met a gas that's renewable, and I'm curious how you're defining it. Sure. So uh, currently, um, Vermont Gas has a program where you can sign up uh, for a tariff and you can say, I want to essentially pay a premium to support a renewable gas project uh, that's essentially become part of their system. Um, the different technologies that provide that, um, there are a few that I'm aware of. Uh, one is uh, there can be kind of a farm uh, methane uh, digester type project, which they have, I think, in Addison County, um, where you're, you're looking at using a, a digester and providing a renewable gas that way that can be put into the system. Uh, there's also, I believe, uh, landfill gas capture that can be used as renewable gas. Uh, there may be other technologies as well. Um, but that would be the, the idea behind it is to say you can't just use a conventional system and use conventional fuel. You have to pay the additional premium and claim the renewable fuel. Um, and that has some additional cost to it. Uh, whether that's more cost effective than paying the carbon fee or more cost effective than the other options, uh, really varies by scenario. Uh, in some cases it might be, in some cases it, it wouldn't be. Um, in some of the analysis I was just mentioning uh, that we had done, um, the electrification options uh, for the existing building retrofit that we looked at, uh, the electrification option was the cheaper option. Um, so uh, we, we certainly, as the electric company, we support uh, electric options, obviously, but we try to be, I think, in the city, uh, inclusive of various renewable fuels and options. 
thanks for talking me through that. And you know, that that sounds good, but I'm curious about the how how able we will be to actually enforce that. You know, is it just making sure that when someone builds something new, they pay the premium the first time? Like, what's the oversight of that in the future, just on a practical level? And does the the kind of bonus of including gas and being inclusive on that front really outweigh the potential risk that you're just creating a loophole? No, it's a great question. We've, we've given that a lot of thought. I think there's two ways to do it uh, in terms of the renewable fuel. One would be that the customer provides evidence at time of permit of a long-term contract uh, with the fuel provider, uh, which would match the lifetime of the system. So if it's a 25-year heating system, they provide a 25-year agreement to purchase the renewable uh, fuel. That's one option. The second option would be um, at the time of permit, you say, okay, I'm going to purchase renewable fuel. Then every year, the Department of Permitting and Inspections uh, would require a certification from the fuel provider that you've actually purchased that fuel. Um, and if you didn't, then you could be subject to a pro rata uh, portion of the carbon fee that you avoided up front. So I think there's a couple different ways to ensure actual compliance and avoid um, having somebody say they're signing up for renewable but not actually follow through with it. Because uh, certainly you can imagine a scenario if you didn't have the enforcement where somebody says, oh, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to purchase, and they do it for a year, but then they stop, and then the policy has been undermined. So we would envision a continuous enforcement and monitoring if somebody doesn't have a long-term contract right up front. Got it. Appreciate that. Um, and then happy to hold a second question if other folks have questions, but it doesn't quite seem like that, so I'll just go ahead. Um, I'm curious, it's kind of slightly switching tracks. You all mentioned that you're focusing on building greenhouse gas use. I'm curious about if there are policy shifts, if you're collaborating with GMT, et cetera, in the future to work on not just arriving at net zero, which is, you know, kind of a complicated um, number to get to and is really different from actually cutting emissions. Um, I'm, I'm curious about what you all see in the future in terms of incentivizing public transit and getting people out of cars and, and doing that kind of efficiency work. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll just touch on, on the buses for a moment, and then Jen may have some items to add just kind of more broadly as well. But um, we're big fans of electric transit buses. Um, we helped in 2020 uh, to provide incentives and grants for the first two electric transit buses that GMT is operating. And we've been communicating with them, and I, I think they have desire to purchase additional electric transit buses, and we've let them know that we're uh, happy to continue uh, providing incentives to support the purchase of those buses, obviously working with them on the infrastructure to charge those buses, uh, try to charge them off peak when we can uh, charge them uh, more cheaply and save money for the transit system and for the electric system, uh, and obviously fuel them with 100% renewable electricity uh, in Burlington. So we've made a little bit of headway with the first two. We'd like to see uh, many, many more come into the transit fleet and support uh, electrification of transit that way. But um, uh, Jen, maybe you have some thoughts on the broader conversation. Sure, yeah. Lena, thanks for bringing that up. So if you were to go to the BED website and click in the upper right-hand corner, our little Net Zero Energy logo, you'll find the roadmap. And you'll see in the roadmap that uh, reducing vehicle miles traveled is a key part of our strategy in, in addition to building electrification. So in addition to the buses that Darren mentioned, we are supporting car share and helping car share in their electrification, which we think is, is, uh, is important. We don't expect everyone to buy an electric vehicle. As a matter of fact, you know, we really hope that we can reduce vehicle miles traveled by transitioning folks to, to public transit and through better biking and walking infrastructure, and, and car share is part of that. I'll also mention our support of e-bikes. So we've invested um, in local motion. We're helping local motion with their lending library. There's an e-bike lending library in case you're not aware. The idea being that you can go try a variety of e-bikes and then either buy online if that suits you best or even better yet, buying an e-bike locally. And then of course we have, and I'm looking at Jason because we are on the Old Spokes Home board together. Um, we're really encouraging um, conventional bikes and we're lucky to have partners like Old Spokes Home and partners um, in, the, in the credit union space who are offering very generous uh, incentives um, to make buying bikes, conventional or e-bike, possible for so many folks. 
Cool. Thank you. And then just one last thought. I'm really excited about the electric buses. I live in the Champlain College area, and they're still driving around those big, nasty school buses. Um, they're painted green, but they still belch some wicked exhaust and just would love to love to see incentives either for them or just making them purchase electric buses because it's so much pollution from them as well. Yeah, no, it's a great point. And I, I would say if you if anybody has conversations with uh, it doesn't have to be Green Mountain Transit. If there are other uh, providers of, of transit services or um, transportation services, um, even if we don't have an incentive program that's uh, available, we have the ability to design a custom incentive for customers as long as the vehicle is registered here in Burlington and is going to charge here in Burlington. So we'd be really happy to work with uh, work, work with them or anyone else to get more diesel buses uh, off the street and get more electric buses, uh, transit uh, buses or otherwise onto the street. So uh, totally agree with you, we're, we're for it and uh, we're happy to help. Um, so uh, please send them our way or we'll, we'll try to initiate some conversations uh, where we can as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. I don't know if we had any other. I can't see everybody that's on the on the phone there, but you have anyone so, else online? So while we've got you here, I thought I'd I'd ask you. So as far as the Burlington Electric Department is concerned, so what is your greatest challenge at this point? Is there anything that you're frustrated about or anything? And what are the, the things that are happening at the Burlington Electric Department that you're most proud of? Mm. Mm. I know you've mentioned a lot of things tonight, but is yeah. there anything in either that you're frustrated with or what's your biggest challenge or what's your, thank you. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, in terms of our, our challenges, uh, one of them that we share with pretty much every utility in Vermont, every utility in the region is uh, there are significant uh, amount of volatility in winter energy prices right now uh, on the New England grid. And we're fortunate in Burlington because we're 100% renewable, because we have the McNeil wood chip plant, uh, which can store fuel and run during the winter time. We can insulate our customers from a lot of the rate impact uh, and cost impact that the winter prices uh, have. Um, so I guess one thing that's it's a challenge, but it's also just kind of letting folks know how important the McNeil plant is to us right now. Uh, we had a 3.95% rate increase uh, in fiscal year 23. Uh, we're seeing utilities around Vermont and around the region that are looking at double digit, in some cases triple digit uh, rate increases because of these winter prices. So uh, in addition to being an important part of our renewable portfolio of uh, generation resources, it's also really important from a uh, price standpoint. I think that's something maybe that people aren't aware of that it's important for us to share. Um, and in terms of things that we're excited about, um, uh, I couldn't be more excited about the community's uh, embrace and enthusiasm of the net zero energy uh, goal and mission. Uh, we just had uh, last night a uh, calendar contest uh, celebration with fourth graders from the elementary schools around the community who help us make the artwork uh, for our net zero energy 2023 calendar. Um, it's great to see um, uh, students from around the community be engaged in, uh, you know, with art uh, on, on things like wind power and how to save energy using uh, clotheslines and how to, we had several electric bus uh, pictures in there. Uh, we just had our first net zero festival uh, this year, which was just down the road here at 585 Pine Street. Um, and it, it was really just another opportunity to share with the community our enthusiasm for electric vehicles and bikes and heat pumps and all the different technologies. And uh, it's, it's great to see people who are supportive of that um, and who came out to support our revenue bond to, to, to help with electrification back in December of 2021. So I think we're, we're grateful for the community's support around these issues. Um, I don't know, Jen, what, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Darren. That was that's probably what I'd say. I might just add um, on a more micro level, I think the supply chain has been frustrating for some of our customers. We know folks are eager, eager to buy electric vehicles. We're in constant communication with the dealers who supply electric vehicles, and they're frustrated that they can't get what people want. So um, not much we can control there, but that, that is a frustration nonetheless. And I think in addition to what Darren's saying about community support, which is so paramount to success, are the various tools that we have in our toolbox for change. So how fortunate that we can be thinking about policy coupled with the technological support we can offer and the financial resources as well. So that's a good thing. Okay, so you can handle, Burlington Electric 
department can handle all the increased load that's going to be coming because of the electric vehicles and lawnmowers and bicycles? We can. We can handle them. We can. Uh, we actually have, have a good amount of room in our system currently, and the revenue bond was really about creating some additional investment uh, so that if there is, uh, which we hope there is, lots of new Burlingtonian uh, customers who are using heat pumps, using uh, electric vehicles, electric lawn equipment, uh, we're going to make improvements to the grid to help accommodate that. And as long as people keep adopting these technologies, we'll keep making the investments uh, in the grid uh, to keep pace with that. And that'll be something that's not only good environmentally, uh, but it'll be helpful from a rate standpoint as well, because it'll mean we're using the system uh, even more, but in a way that's beneficial, in a way that reduces fossil fuel use. Um, so we're excited about that future and definitely interested to make those investments provided uh, the demand is there. Yeah. Try a question. Yeah. Sure. I was wondering if you're anticipating a lot of upgrades in 2023 and beyond from the kind of federal government uh, incentives or rebates or whatever whatever kind of framework they put around those. Like personally, I was looking for my small house that has a 100 amp service, maybe should have been 90 amp service with the kind of wires coming in. Uh, it, that's not going to work. We have an EV hooked up already and we can't right. put a heat pump and whatnot. So I think there was something for panel upgrades or certainly something for solar and, and EVs going forward too. I wonder if you're anticipating a, a big jump there or, or help, you know, yeah. tailwinds from that. Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, there's there's different, there's a couple different packages that were passed at the federal level. Uh, there's an infrastructure bill that has a lot of money for EV charging that's starting to roll out uh, through the state. Um, there's the uh, ARPA legislation during the, the pandemic that really uh, created some new opportunities. Uh, the state, for example, has uh, $5 million to help uh, low-income Vermonters um, with changing out to heat pump water heaters. Uh, there's $20 million at the state level for exactly what you just mentioned, helping folks with upgrading their electric panels uh, to accommodate new uses. And then the Inflation Reduction Act has significant tax credits and funding rebates uh, for heat pumps, uh, for solar, for uh, upgrading panels. And so we definitely see it largely as creating a tailwind and adding to the incentives that we offer and that the state in some cases offers uh, for the technologies. In the EV space, it actually could be in the near term uh, that it's harder to get the federal tax credit because they put some parameters around it uh, in terms of where the vehicle's assembled, where the battery and, and materials are assembled. Uh, so as the automakers switch uh, production, hopefully more towards uh, the United States or North America, more EVs will qualify. Uh, but in the near term, there may actually be, it may be harder to get the tax credit on the EV side. On the flip side, there's never really been uh, a tax credit or, or funding uh, at the federal level to support heat pumps or to support uh, panel upgrades. And now there will be. So uh, we're still waiting for the rules to be written by the various agencies at the federal level on how these programs are going to work. Uh, we're hopeful we can communicate with customers sometime around January about what types of incentives are going to be available and how they can access them. Uh, but yeah, that example is a great example. We have a lot of uh, Burlingtonians with 100 amp service and uh, that might be adequate if you have uh, just traditional uses uh, at your home, but if you're going to have an electric vehicle, if you're going to have a heat pump or a heat pump water heater, you may need uh, better service, 200 amp service. Uh, that can be expensive, or you might need to be able to upgrade your panel. Uh, that may cost a thousand or two thousand dollars, and so having some incentives and funding uh, to support that enables more people to look at a heat pump and look at an EV and say, "Yeah, I, I can do it." Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That will be a big expense I'm not looking forward to, but maybe oh. we'll get a little help. Understood. But, yeah, hopefully there's some help on the way. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. Anything else come up here? All right. Well, thanks a lot for, for coming and talking to us about this. Thank you so much yeah, for having thank us. thank you. We appreciate the invite. Yeah. Great to be with you. Well, good evening. You too. Everyone online, too, have a good evening. Thanks for calling in. Have a good night. We'll talk to you next month.